This video is brought to you by The Ridge Wallet. Another day, another cancelled film project to talk about. Honestly, the more I look, the more I find scraps leaking out practically everywhere. But so far in the series, we've already started looking at the dramatic disaster piece that was Pixar's business turns in the mid-2000s, so let's continue that a little further. If you're not aware, last time we covered the cancelled Toy Story sequel set to be the original Toy Story 3 back in 2004. And the reason we started there first is because it simply had the most information about it. And so I was planning to bolt together the other two scrap projects from that period, but as I started researching into the video, I've discovered that there's actually way more details to talk about here. I'm talking 103 pages of reading kind of way more. So let's not diddle daddle any longer and talk about another hint of a darker timeline we could have felt 15 years ago, the cancelled Finding Nemo sequel. Now if you haven't seen our Toy Story video and haven't already left since it was last mentioned, then I'll briefly catch you up on the context. Back in 2004, Disney and Pixar had a falling out and split ways. But Disney owned the rights to Pixar's characters and decided to start production on their own sequels without Pixar in the picture. Pixant was their nickname, though they officially went by Disney Circle 7 Animation. Anyway, during this time, three sequels were started. Toy Story, Finding Nemo, and Monsters Inc., each at varying stages of progression. We'll cover Monsters Inc. one day, but for Finding Nemo, they actually made the least progress. And this is clear by the fact that there is not a single piece of concept art drawn up for the project. No locations, characters, storyboards, anything. Hence why our thumbnail was one made by my girlfriend again. But the reason we're talking about it as if we do have so much information about it is because we do, very directly. The entire 103 page script is available to read in full and hear every story be planned in at least one draft of the full runtime. I'll link it in the description if you wanna check it out if I remember, but with that in mind, Let's delve into just how this sequel was originally planned to go. Now, obviously, this came before Finding Dory, but do note it was created by entirely different people, so when the project fell apart, all these ideas were concretely scrapped and did not inspire Dory at all. Maybe. We'll, we'll come back to this in a moment. But we do know precisely who wrote the script. It was done by Laurie Craig, previously working on Paulie and Ella Enchanted at the time, as well as Ramona and Beezus and Rio too since then. As for the directions of this new Nemo rendition, it's interesting. While Finding Dory is all about the adventures and inner struggle of Dory coming to terms with her short-term memory loss and symbolically finding herself and her family, the sequel to Finding Nemo here was set to be named Finding Nemo 2. Bold. Though actually, the story isn't at all about finding Nemo again. He isn't even captured again, technically. No, rather it's a whole role reversal with- Okay, you know what, let's just tackle things in chronological order. It, it kind of catches up to you fast. There's a lot more to this story than just fish napping this time around. I'll try my best to represent the ideas of the film in the format of the footage of the films we do have. Whatever's best to keep up the kind of imagery they're going for, you know? There's an attempt. So picture this. We start off in the opening sequence of the first film again, but now at a different angle. Everything plays out the same, but there's one pivotal retcon being introduced. Nemo is the only surviving egg, right? He's an only child, and that's what provokes Marlin's helicopter parenting and further disadvantages Nemo with his little fin. Turns out, in this film, Nemo isn't an only child, and instead there was another egg survivor way further down. Marlin never spots it, and the egg is gently brushed away from the site, caught in a bottle and randomly plucked away by a tiger shark. Also, by the way, reading a Nemo script, I never realised how little I knew marine creatures. I know sharks, but what's a tiger shark? Oh, it's that one. Good to know. Okay. Bit weird, but anyway, we'll continue. The egg goes on a miniature little journey until it ends up in another nest filled with fellow yellowfish eggs this time. The prologue has been set. We now skip to after the events of the first film, where the new character conflict has Nemo being big-headed after his adventure, and Marlin is concerned over his parenting for being too protective and allowing Nemo to be so cocky. Meanwhile, Dory goes for a wander and discovers a lost bottlenose dolphin with a tracker on its fin from a place called Planet Blue, though neither of them recognise it's a tracker. But in the conversation, Dory does go on to randomly spout that bottlenose dolphins do have well-defined home ranges and they are high highly skilled echolocators, producing a range of clicking sounds in different frequencies. It is something they are both stunned she knows details of. That, that kind of comes up in Finding Dory. Weird. 
Anyway, as Nemo moves on, something else is stalking him, but he notices it. He comes up to an archway before confronting his stalker, another clownfish kid. They have a standard mirror sequence together where they're exactly identical apart from Nemo's lucky fin. Oh yeah, so just randomly in the middle of this morning, it's Nemo's long lost brother that shows up. Described here as seeming older, his cheeks leaner, face grown a little more handsome, he has more swagger and more attitude than Nemo apparently. We took some artistic liberties over here with an eye patch. Oh, also in our imagination, he has rat ears because his name is, no joke, Remy. Uh, I guess Pixar literally just recycled the name not three years later, Max. Huh. So Remy here managed to find them all after hearing about their big journey and hearing about scattered eggs. I don't remember when I don't remember when that was in the all right and tells of how he survived by being raised by a clan of fighting firefish that's the direction for the new finding nemo anyway remy boasts that he can win any fight in three deadly moves so as expected remy is now integrated with the group reunited with his father and they go and play catch with a pebble because apparently toy story 2 scene just wasn't enough to scratch that itch already. And yeah, a bit of a sibling rivalry also starts to brew here. With Remy knocking down Nemo in a sports game and Nemo successfully answering a question in Mr. Ray's class that Remy couldn't. Everyone close to Nemo seems to prefer Remy and it's kind of like a prince dethroned as they describe it. And Nemo's bad fin especially makes him feel inferior. So to keep the story going now, tomorrow is a very special day cause it's Nemo's birthday. Well, except, I guess it's Remy's birthday too, of course. Neither of them are happy on the day though, with Marlin failing to sufficiently support either of them. When split between Nemo's preferred game of choice and Remy's, Marlin votes to go with Remy's first, causing Nemo to storm off in a grump. It's, you know, your family drama type. Everybody's stressed. Marlin even goes on to say about his parenting, Really? Cause I don't feel like I'm doing fine. I feel like I need a drink. Do fish drink? I know last time we had the whole recurring gag with sketchy, sketchy script descriptions, but honestly, Laurie's writing for this script is pretty tasteful and a whole lot less uh, pubescent, shall we say. But hey, there's somewhat of an adult joke for you. So Nemo and Remy fight, Marlin crashes in to break it up, and now Remy goes off on a strop, shouting at Marlin for abandoning him in the first place. It seems like your standard family drama so far, right? A little out of left field considering the prologue retcon, but it's expansive, sure, all right. Here's where a whole extra layer of plot comes in that's not really needed, I guess you gotta stick with the formula, I guess. So now, that dolphin from before makes a reappearance being chased by a butt. They never actually say, they, they don't call back to it, but I'm gonna do it for them. The dolphin is netted and Remy is caught in the swing, only for Marlin to push Remy out of the way and take his place. This is a Finding Marlin story. Though that title doesn't really roll off the tongue, does it? So Dory arrives on the scene and is caught up on events where she knows she has helpful information, and hey, actually it is a bit of a dodgy script piece. Dory is trying to remember details through a rhyming trick that Mr. Ray taught her, babbling all of this. Wait! Stop talking. I have to remember it. It's a rhyme. It rhymes with bowling shoe, uh, uh, oyster shoe, uh, wandering Jew. Uh, I can't really imagine those words coming out of Dory's mouth, but all right. O also cheese fondue. Uh, eventually she remembers it's planet blue. That's where the dolphin stalkers are from. And so the three head off for a rescue. As for Marlin and the dolphin, they end up at planet blue and it's a large scale marine park. Sound kind of familiar? It's not exactly an aquarium marine hospital park, but I'm getting awfully familiar vibes from the location of Finding Dory. Actually, this is also part aquarium. Should we sure this is a good coincidence from Pixar? Still, instead of being plonked into some kind of storage room, Marlin is never noticed and ends up in the dolphin exhibit, where it's actually a dolphin performance show. The dolphins are all theater kids, ones particularly Shakespearean, like that one toy from the real Toy Story 3. Here's another slightly dodgy script piece. Marlin's freaking out. What were you talking about? We were just in the ocean. We were caught by a net. Jeez, I can't believe I'm this unlucky. To which one dolphin replies, mm. Hey, nets happen. Maybe I'm reading that too much, but it sounds like a sly adult gag to me, you know? Nets happen? Anyway. So with Marlin a fish out of ocean water, the dolphins perform. They're jumping through hoops, there's chorus lines, directors singing, everything, and Marlin can do nothing but watch the wacky cacophony. And this is your brief reminder to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you want more Finding Nemo stuff, we are streaming the game on Twitch. Finding Nemo, the game. 
Meanwhile, apparently not that far away, Nemo, Remy, and Dory are next seen making it to the coastline of the place. So much for the ocean-sized adventure that they had beforehand. Finding Dory at least touches on the turtle transportation and some danger along the way. Nemo too just pops them into existence here. Still, they've got to work out a way inside. Here's an extract for you. Dory goes on to say, hmm, that's a very good question. If we could just get the ocean levels to rise, we need some global warming. Anybody got a match? <laughs> Meanwhile, Remy and Nemo come up with opposing strategic plans. Remy dives into action towards a dangerous propeller, kinda similar to the filter in the original film, that succeeded only thanks to the luck of a branch coming in and jamming the thing as they attempt it. And in the next segment, Nemo tries to swim upstream against a strong current onwards, but fails, feeling humiliated. Remy is reckless, and Nemo always hesitantly thinks instead. Opposites, you see. So who's here to help out but another callback to the first film that doesn't appear in the plot for Fighting Dory, Gil. Uh, just him though. Apparently the company went their different ways. He hears their story and is skeptical to help since Planet Blue is all tanks and he hates tanks. Also, Dory's apparently been here before. Quote, it's hard to explain, but I think I've been there before. No fish has ever come out of it. But maybe she did and she just forgot. Yeah, 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 I, I forget a lot, Will. It's Gil. So Gil is guilted into helping out, where he explains that there are in and out pipes and they need to switch them round by clogging the flow. But Gil's got assistance in yet another coincidence from finding Dory, sea lions. Lazy ones, because the abundance of human food has made them so. And while they do still hang out on a rock in the sun, their character traits are that they are always sleepy and unmotivated this time. But for this one time, the lions work together to steal a parasail and jam up the intake pipe, allowing the gang to move through the outward pipe. The three have a moment of shouting echo in the pipe, not unlike that scene from The Incredibles, and hey, just like Finding Dory, they come across an octopus after the pipe. Though this one is a silent enemy tangling around tentacles and at one point getting duped into shaking his own hand and then throwing them off in frustration. <laughs> I like that. And eventually they end up right by the dolphin exhibit. Nemo says, I hope dad's okay, to which Dory replies, oh, you know your father. Cool in a crisis. <laughs> Marlin, meanwhile, is trying to get the dolphin's attention mid-performance and they eventually help him by lobbing him out with their tails and into a bucket that a janitor takes away. Meanwhile, the humans have just started working on the parasail clogging job. Dory, Remy, and Nemo make it to the dolphins, but Marlin is long gone... somewhere. Marlin on his journey though gets to witness the horrors that is the kitchen fish prep and ends up in the polar bear pool, something we don't actually see in the legitimate Nemo series. And while Marlin should be very dead here, he meets a bullied polar bear called Blanca who's more neurotic than he is, who befriends and then protects him instead. Talk about lucky. Meanwhile, back at Nemo and Remy, they dash in opposite directions with their own plans, only for Dory to be stuck in the middle, and then gets netted by the staff. What follows is actually a really interesting sequence of the boys escaping the next netting attempt. The dolphins reprise their performance, but now aiming to disrupt the workers and sabotage the attempt. Staff are splashed and hit and dunked into the water as the boys dash into another pipe to take them to the polar bear exhibit, and the audience are loving it the whole way through. But at the same time, the humans are working on that parasail problem and just as they succeed their escape, the flow is reintegrated and they're flushed in the complete wrong direction. Oops. But all of that sounds like a fantastic sequence to watch. They end up in an abandoned remodeling pirate cove aquarium, both bonding on their mutual seasickness. Also with the flow now working, the polar pool is getting progressively cooler. We also learn that Blanca is being bullied for being a bear from Cleveland and not the Arctic, as well as being uncoordinated. Funny how Cleveland pops up again in script in Finding Dory. Investigating separately, Remy chats to a clam and crab who tell him to look out for himself, and he does so, finding an exit pipe and taking it without Nemo. Though Nemo spots him and wallops him in the face for it. Undisturbed sibling fighting, you know? Remy flees, almost crying, and is confronted by a massive sea snake next. Danger time. Nemo watches from the sidelines, advising Remy to use his three deadly moves, but he's frozen in place. So Nemo crashes in to distract. The snake thinks they're seeing double, because obviously they're the same fish. They're both chased through the pipelines and end up in a new exhibit we've also seen in Finding Dory, the petting zone. Though now it's outside and more like a gentle grabby inconvenience than Toy Story 3 version 2, you know? Also for another callback, the mine seagulls all appear here too. Still in chase, the snake then bursts from the pipes to which the seagulls Girls pull back and say, yours? <laughs> I'll admit, that probably make me chuckle in the cinema. Like just one turning to the other like that. Anyway, K 
chaos. The kids run, the seagulls scatter, and staff leap on over to net the snake. And with the danger gone, Remy is shivering. Apparently his punch wound is infected. A little out of nowhere, but... All right. Remy is netted in his vulnerable state and Nemo jumps in with him. They're dropped in a dark isolation tank with human hands and antibiotics, though they don't actually know this is good news. And remember Gil? Yeah, he's been trying to motivate the sea lions to clog the pipes again the second time all the way through this moment. Finally succeeding only now by getting them to bark incessantly or something. Inspired, they swipe life vests, barbecue grills, and fishing tackle. They look like they're starting to wake up and move with a new sense of purpose. And speaking of a new purpose, today's video is sponsored by the Ridge Wallet. Easily fitting into any of your pockets without so much of a bulge, it can hold up to 12 cards as well as cash. Each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty as well as a 45 day money back guarantee. It's a great gift option for Christmas. So visit ridge.com forward slash daz and use the code daz to get 10% off. And thanks again to Ridge for sponsoring us. Now, back to an alternate fishy timeline. And hey, this isn't exactly a sketchy script description, but it is unexpected. Wanna know what Marlin's up to? He's growing attached to the polar bear. Do you ever wonder if we had met in another place, another time? Sure, I don't know where that would be exactly. Blanca, I... <sighs> my heart is with my boys. Can we talk about something else? This series doesn't really cover romance much, it's not the point, but a clownfish and a polar bear certainly seems extreme to me, you know? Anyway, by this point, Remy's infection has him delirious, spouting out his real thoughts to Nemo. I wasn't raised by fighting fish, I was raised by weed fish, hundreds of them, too many mouths to feed. I never fit in. That's why I came looking for... <sighs> He's all I have. Didn't know the father's name was Huh, but there you go. That was a dumb joke. It's not even in the script. Why did I say that? It's the heart to heart moment, with Nemo comforting Remy as he swats at nothing. Then the timeline gets a little weird. For Marlin, it starts snowing and he's getting chilly, but then we come back to Remy and Nemo again, who have apparently been sleeping overnight. They talk about last night anyway. Maybe they're just disorientated. Either way, they're now back with Remy feeling better and dropped in the coral tank. This is gonna sound awfully familiar. The tank is a at least two stories tall and filled with all sorts of coral and familiar looking reef fish. This is almost to a T the kind of tank from Finding Dory and her home. And what do you know, Dory is here. And she leads them both to her family. Not a couple of parents this time, but to a school of 50 blue tank fish. This is also where Dory learned to read, just like in the canon film. The three catch up, though Remy admits his injury came from Nemo, and it's something that Nemo appreciates, and Dory's siblings tell that Dory was also adventurous and just had to see the ocean, apparently. There's a bit of backstory for you. Marlin is shivering like crazy, cradled in Blanca's fur belly that reminds him of the anemone tentacles from back home. And the Nemo gang's next plan now is to jump into the pro skimmer as it's being replaced in the tank. It's a system not too unlike the tank filter from the first film, honestly. But Dory is torn on staying at home with her family or sticking with her newfound family instead. And last minute, she joins Nemo in the leap to the filter. With Marlin on the edge of death, Blanca makes a new move, creating a ladder out of the exhibit environment, climbing along the border and escaping from up high. Something miraculous for her coordination. She bursts out with Marlin in a bucket out onto the amusement park grounds. Panic. Civilians scatter, staff tail her, and she's dodging a barrage of tranquilizer shots. She makes it towards a pond before being hit last minute. Marlin dryly struggles between the two with a last interaction of Marlin gasping. Thank you. I'll never forget you, and Blanca drowsily muttering, Goodbye, Marlin, I love you. Wrapping up that wholesome, yet still kinda weird romantic plot. Gil, meanwhile, has clogged that pipe fully, though a human diver has now come to investigate, so how else to solve the problem than with a Deus Ex Machina callback that we didn't get in Finding Dory, with the reappearance of none other than Bruce with his titular... Hello. The diver, quote, gets the hell out of there. The Nemo gang's plan is a success and they're dropped somewhere murky. It's tense, practically nothing can be seen in the distance and someone's approaching. It's Marlin. They all hug in reunion, though Remy feels left out. He runs off barely legible from the murk, but Nemo is the one to come to comfort him. And Marlin appears to say, Look, I may be new at this, and maybe I'm not very good at it yet, but I can handle it. Whatever comes our way. But I think love is like snow. 
They look at him confused. There's always more when you need it. Something Blanca said to him in the polar exhibit. I should have found you. I'm sorry I didn't. Come home with us now, Remy. And though it's happy family time, the adventure isn't actually over just yet, as the humans have a counter to the shark problem, firing up the Super Pumper. As the group heads through the pond's exit pipes, emergency valves begin slamming shut. They have to escape back where they came from quickly. Everyone makes a bolt back, and Dory's so involved in the moment that she whacks her head on escape. And hey, if the premise of a long lost brother or a polar bear romance or all the strange Dory parallels wasn't enough weirdness, Here's a whole new spanner in the works. From that head bump, Dory then goes on to entirely remember everything. Her short term memory loss is cured in this script. I personally don't like that decision and much prefer the route that Finding Dory took, but let's see where this revelation takes us. She remembers how she first lost her memory from bumping her head on her way out the first time, and now knows perfectly how to get out from here. So they come to yet another exhibit, and one we haven't seen in Dory, the Flamingo Exhibit. The group have to dart across the waters, dodging the poking beaks as they go along, and of course Dory has the perfect memory to command them all when and where to weave throughout the whole sprint. And to fly out of the park's borders without the use of the flowing pipes, they must ride, believe it or not, the water ride for humans that's been on site at the amusement park. It's actually kind of cool because they kept showing it in the background and mentioning it in the script so it was actually established, but anyway, seems like a Toy Story kind of action sequence to me, honestly. Everyone is hesitantly scared, but they go for it anyway, being hoisted up by a water wheel system where Dory then remembers it was here she was whacked by the water ride sliding down and hitting her on the head. So what's the solution this time to avoid the inevitable hurt? There isn't one. They all just let it happen again. No, really. Ouch. The crash sends them all flying, and of course a camera catches them mid-air for a little gag. They end up in some river rapids and out to a calm bay, briefly thinking Remy's missing, but he's not. They've made it across the border. They wave off Gil and the sea lions, and they serenade back in howling barks that motivates them, but it rattles Gil. He's created a musical monster, apparently. I can't tell if Dory loses her memory again, because she seems to do a fake out with it, but then continues to be her normal ditzy self, so I don't know. As a family of four, they venture off into the deep back home, bickering like any family does on a long distance car trip. And that's the end. Honestly, that wasn't terrible. It's certainly not the dated Toy Story 3 script. It relies a whole lot more on random callbacks for fan service reason and doesn't have that modern comedic twang that the real Finding Dory has because of the year difference of course, but I don't absolutely hate it. I tell you what though, the amount of recurring elements that did actually end up in the final Finding Dory makes me supremely skeptical that Pixar didn't read and pluck pieces they liked. I mean, sure, I can see the octopus being a cool coincidence, but Aquarium Park, Coral Tank, Dory's family learning to read here, sea lions on a rock, the petting zone? Sure, I guess with marine life you are kind of limited to what kind of stories can be told, but there's just so many going on here. I don't know. Now, as much as I did enjoy this alternative reality of a Finding Nemo sequel, you still gotta admit, it pales in comparison to Finding Dory, which is fair. Not only is this an earlier stage of development, but Pixar had all sorts of formulaic goodness to boost up their stories in their later years. We may all kinda dig on it now, but Pixar's trope of trying to make the audiences cry makes for good storytelling. And with us having such a baby-faced Dory and the whole shell story with her parents, it's way better than the generic uh, trials of just a new brother in the mix throwing things off. And the fact that Marlin is stolen doesn't really add too much other than an adventure to grow closer during. In fact, that whole element really wasn't all that necessary. It's just a formula thing. Remy is the enticing new addition to this film after all, but it seems difficult to juggle anyway. That being said, I liked the fan service and subversions we did see. I'd love to see that octopus and dolphin sequence, but I guess considering all the other baggage that would come with the Circle 7 animation team, I'm more than happy to be in this reality here. It's not always perfect, as this last year has shown, but things get better, and we could be doing a whole lot worse for ourselves. There was a little exploration into the cancelled Finding Nemo sequel. Dory has no parents, the memory is fixable, Marlin fell in love with a polar bear, and Nemo has had a secret brother this whole time. Think I prefer him when he's a rat in a French chef's hat though. For now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit. <sighs>
Thanks for making it to the end of this video, you are a rare one. And it's, there's no way there's like, this is a big Pixar like coincidence that all these assets overlap, right? Like, it just seems way too convenient that all these things kept coming back, made it easy to edit. You know, there's a lot of Fighting Dory assets we could use, but anyway, the code word for saying that you've made it to the end of the video is Coral. So use that in a comment, settle it in, and I know that you are a real fan. I guess. <laughs>